Is your team not performing well? Is morale low and turnover high? Are you falling further behind the competition? I'm here to help. I'm your host, Shaney, and this is The Leadership Show, where business strategy and culture finally meet, and we make the long-awaited shift from rhetoric to results. I promise I'm not your typical boring leadership consultant, and I will help you get your shift together. Let's do this. Hey, hey, leader shifters, and welcome to another episode of the Leadership Show with Shaney. I am psyched about today's guest. Please welcome Brian Mehta, who is Chief Marketing Officer of a company called Trading Technologies that we're going to learn a little bit about today. And let me tell you a couple of reasons why I'm so excited. First of all, to have the CMO of a company on. This is a company that actually, at this point in their life cycle, very much values the role that the, the, the head marketing person brings to the C-suite table. Um, and we will talk about the fact that culture is brand, brand is culture, and how Brian was able to transform this company that when he joined was over 20 years old, and let's just say needed some transformation by bringing culture and, and wearing that marketing hat in the C-suite. And it's also a company that has reinvented itself quite interestingly over the past five years, mainly because of technology, but not exclusively because of technology. Is that fair to say? That's great, yes. Great yeah, so welcome to the show, Brian. Thank you, Shaney. Good to be here. Yeah, so Brian's joining us from Chicago. You guys can see a little bit the sun setting over, I think that's the Sears Tower, now known as the Willis Tower, where I worked briefly for a couple of years. So, Brian, to start us off, tell tell my list, tell our listeners and, and watchers a little bit about your background and what brought you to trading technologies. Yeah, so um, I had always been working for technology and telecom companies my most of my whole career, and primarily in the consumer space. Uh, did some stints at um, SBC, Ameritech, slash AT&T, um, Motorola, U.S. Cellular, and really um, did a lot of consumer marketing, big TV commercials, big budgets, all that kind of stuff. And uh, quite honestly, after doing it for some quite some time, uh, got a little stuck, stuck not just in my, not my career, but just um, stuck in terms of doing the same thing over and over again. And right. uh, I think that happens to a lot of people. Um, but instead of just grinding it out, I knew I had to make a change. Um, and I was fortunate enough to always have um, good networking um, skills as well as just a great network. And um, it so happened that um, befriended a CTO at a company called Trading Technologies and um, and that CTO eventually became CEO and our and our friendly conversations and our and our social interactions eventually became more business type questions and um, all of a sudden it's like hey you know I'm trying to change this company trying to transform this company um, really could use your help and um, did not have uh, much of the capital markets finance experience obviously had a load of marketing experience and um, great transferable skills. And, and Rick's, Rick Lane, the CEO, um, he, he also knew that, that there was enough uh, domain expertise in the company, but really needed um, some strong marketing and communication skills to bring and reinvigorate the company. And about so this great. I years. love that you made the shift. You were yes. bored in your career. A lot of people would just stay bored or make a move that is only slightly less boring. Instead, you made a shift to a, a, a different kind of challenge. I love that. I think a fundamental shift sometimes is really important because, as I said, you could get stuck and then you could almost, your skills and your enthusiasm and your, your drive could start to wear down and diminish. But yep. when you have a major shift, um, that forces you to, um, you know, sharpen up again. And that's what I was doing. Um, when I joined the company, 
every time I came home, I was so tired because I was absorbing so much new things, learning right. so much new things. It was great. Yeah. So before I ask you some more questions about, you know, my, my typical culture and, um, and, and how you've integrated that in, let's just give listeners a bit of a sense of what trading technologies does. And, 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 and if you don't mind, even just a little quick 101 on what futures are, because a lot of my followers are finance people like I used to be, but a lot of them are not. So trading technologies were 25 years old. And actually, the company was really the pioneer in terms of bringing electronic trading uh, to, to, to be what we are now. And, um, so you guys are responsible for lower margins on Wall Street. No. <laughs> well, I, I think uh, um, folks would say responsible for faster, more efficient uh, markets and trading. But totally, I was just joking, wearing my former, you know, buy or sell side trading floor hat. Sorry. Well, no, and and <laughs> one of the nice things is a lot of um, individuals from the floor came to join. The company because I, there's a lot of experience not just um, really knowing the markets knowing how traders think and and what are the tools that will help traders translate the pit trading into efficient electronic trading um, but that was what we were doing for 20 years is really delivering the market leading execution platform how to trade the best how to develop um, uh, spread trading, how to, how to uh, trade different markets across, you know, all the globally across the different product sets. And we were doing that for about 20 years. And about, uh, I, I should say about six years ago, um, we thought, how are we going to survive the next 20 years? Um, we can no longer just be an execution trading platform that was installed at the customer premise. So we made the shift to develop a new platform that was uh, that had software as a service as the delivery mechanism, yep. strengthened our global network, and now we have not only a, a trade execution platform that is flexible to trade futures as well as fixed income options and cryptocurrency, okay. but the platform is flexible enough to add uh, new products or, and, and eventually future products that we could integrate into the platform. Like, and we'll probably talk more about this, um, surveillance, machine learning tools to help with uh, compliance and surveillance traits. Absolutely, support. park that one because I definitely want to come back to it. Um, so walk us back to what, what, you, what you walked into at Trading Technologies because you were brought on to reinvigorate the company, transform the company. So what was the challenge? What did you do? And what were the results? <laughs> I mean, I think similar, you know, almost like an analogy to my career, the company had been successful for a long, long time. But the company was a little stuck. And so um, me and the leadership team wanted to do some transformational change. And the transformational change, um, was at all levels and, and we like to call it the three C's, our craft, our communication, and our culture. Um, the craft is our product and we needed to make yeah. a fundamental change. And I, I, I articulated that we went from um, an old platform to a software as a service platform, as well as offering new products. Sure. But we had to not only change the product, but people that were developing that product. Um, when you change out um, what people do, how they do it, skill sets, as well as the direction of the company, you have to be so vigilant in communicating. Absolutely. Commun communicating internally as well as externally. And so that was another key in terms of transforming the company. It, it, instead of saying, hey, we're doing everything that we've always done, and a lot of things were sort of... I would say not secretive, but just people were not aware. Bringing that out to the forefront, I think, empowered people as we were making these changes. Got it. And then what you have as a result of greater communication and transparency 
is a strengthening of a culture. Yep. TT has always had a strong culture of in its DNA. And that was, you know, employees working hard for each other as well as the client. And, and that didn't go away. And that's still a great root, um, a great piece of the culture. But what we had to do was take it into the next stage of, of this transformational thinking, pushing it away from, hey, we do what we've always done to say, no, we're going to be um, doing things different, faster, quicker, thinking more like a fintech startup versus right. a software company. Yeah. I love your three C's. I want to pause on that for a second and just make sure those who are listening wrote that down. And you guys know me. I love shortcuts to remember things. Um, and, you know, of course, in marketing, there's the four P's, right? Product, right. price, place, promotion. And now we've got the three C's of really of success for any business. I like the simplification of craft, right? What's your product? Communication, which is so often the uh, one of the key missing pieces. The communication is incomplete, inefficient, or not transparent. Um, and those two things help form the culture as long as well as some intentionality. And and as as you've you've started to hear from me as you've gotten to know me. One of my missions is to get everyone in the executive at the executive level to take culture and move it up to the same level as strategy. They have yeah. to meet because if if culture is somewhere else and you know buried in HR, then there then the companies ne that will never create the environment in which people want to deliver on the brand promise. And that's something you and I were starting to talk about before we went live here. And, and so, you know, let me just tee that up for you in terms of, you know, culture is brand, brand promise, et cetera. What's your take on that, your philosophy? Yeah, absolutely. When, when I joined, it was an intentional thing to do this transformation um, for the brand and combining that with culture. Um, you know, my, my uh, comment is the brand is your promise. And the promise is everything that you say and do and believe. And um, that's culture, right? So, so yeah. when I joined, it was an intentional um, thing to make sure marketing communications was a part of the strategy, part yeah. of the development of where we are going. And, and, I, and I mentioned to you, to you before uh, coming on, the first year, the C CEO, CTO, and I met every day for at least an hour for the first. So and we were developing strategy. And one of the first things was, okay, how do we codify our, our, our principles and our vision? And developing those things is a foundation for the brand. And the foundation... <laughs> that we are sharing with our employees so that they could then bring that to our clients. And so, um, so th those were things that, that had to be accomplished at the first year of joining the company. And that set the foundation, <laughs> um, set the foundation for um, how we transform our craft, how we do better jobs of communicating internally as well as externally, and then also reinvigorating um, the culture. And reinvigorating the culture um, was everything from more, more transparent meetings, more communication, and not only doing that at headquarters, but getting out to our remote locations. So FaceTime globally, <coughs> we have um, what we call what's on tap. It's, it's, uh, it's these all hand company meetings. And uh, we really didn't have those before I joined, maybe once a year. Um, and we, we ramped those up because as we were doing all these changes, we felt like we had to inform people on what was going on. And we started to infuse some fun in these meetings. And we also said, you know what, let's take these meetings on the road. So we went to London, we went to Singapore, we went to Sydney to get those employees involved in the messaging and, and, and believing in the direction of where we were going. 
So all these things happening, I think, I don't want to say we're overwhelmed, they were overwhelmingly welcomed. Um, I'm so sorry about this cough, but like my allergies are really bad right now. And suddenly right in the middle of this, they came on really strong. So I'm, I'm sorry, sorry for everyone who's listening and so sorry for coughing while you're talking, but I am listening intently. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I think it was key to not just get people at the headquarters on board, but it was to get everyone globally on board. And yes, you know, there, there's these thing, great things like Zoom and, 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 and Google Hangouts, but nothing um, is better than face-to-face -face, um, interactions. And we were able to, as a management team, uh, reach out to um, our employees around the globe, as well as clients, and, and just sort of um, get them aligned with where we were going. And uh, that, that has really helped in terms of uh, our business and, and setting, not setting the groundwork for our, our, not just the vision, but for actually implementing yeah. the things that we wanted to do. What, what you've just described to me sounds like a roadshow, right? Um, and people think, oh, Companies go on road shows if they're doing an IPO or secondary offering. I love the idea of a company just going on a road show to, in, to communicate to internal and external audiences about what's happening at the company. And more, well, as important, you could do the initial road show, but you can't just stop there. Right. You have to be consistent. So I still travel around the globe, um, meeting with our, our, our employees as well as customers, just to reinforce what we're doing, just to keep the engagement going. Because it's great that like you do this kickoff and everyone gets excited, but then if you hear crickets um, for the next several quarters, uh, then it could be maybe just uh, false promises or it right. could you know, oh, we did this thing and let's move on to the next thing. I think yeah. consistency is really important. And by doing that, it, it reinforces it and keeps everyone engaged. Yeah. So what is the vision and principles that you guys landed on? If you don't oh, mind wow. sharing. So, um, so uh, the vision is uh, to be the operating system of capital markets. And that's a pretty heady goal right it's yeah it's uh, you know it, it it's basically saying hey we want to be everywhere every touch point where the capital markets flow through happens right um and starting as just a trade execution platform it is pretty ambitious but um we are definitely making steps toward that and as i was mentioning to you earlier um, our clients are, are really seeking that out. With vendor consolidation, cost consolidation, they are looking for partners that can do more than just one thing. Yep. So being an operating system of capital markets, I, I, I think that is, uh, that's, that's a great goal to have. We may never ever like fully get there, but we are definitely taking steps toward that. As I mentioned with offering more trade execution um, products, doing yeah. infrastructure as a service, as a, as a product set, and then data as a product set. Those three, as we call them, pillars of our business, lines of business, that's, that's getting us toward being more of a fully stacked tech company for capital markets. Absolutely. I, I love that. I, I mean, listen, go big or go home. The vision should be something that's a stretch, right? Yeah, I mean, what, what does uh, Google say, but, to, you know, the moonshots, right? And I, and I think that is uh, very applicable to a lot of businesses is like, you know, go for that moonshot. Yeah. If you go, I mean, if who wants a vision that essentially translates to, let's be mediocre. Let's, <laughs> let's, you know, let's aim for, you know, okay, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, and I think, I think sometimes... Um, remind ourselves the moonshot is out there and every day is little steps so you can't just hit moonshots every day right you know, don't be disappointed 
that you're just making incremental steps because those are so critical to building the eventual. Exactly, that's what keeps people motivated day in and day out to do some things that might seem repetitive or <clears throat> what a, you know not very gratifying in the moment, but when they're putting it in the context of that big moonshot kind of vision, it becomes a lot more palatable. Yeah, for sure. So let's talk about some of the things that you guys have done to reach this kind of full stack capacity, among which, and this is gonna take us on two tangents, <clears throat> was an acquisition to get you into the surveillance business. So first tell me, <clears throat> tell us about the acquisition. And before we talk about sort of the compliance piece and what that brings you, let's talk about how you went about bringing the acquired employees and leadership into the TT culture. Yeah. So um, a couple of years ago, we acquired a um, startup company called Norensic, and they had some really great technology. Um, and it was uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence driven surveillance tools and compliance tools. And they had a really good, um, um, I guess technology that could get to um, almost a scoring system of how trade activities um, are within the right zone of compliance and using machine learning to really um, be an iterative process because there's always new rulings and new, new, uh, new, uh, new information from the CFTC. It's an ever-changing environment. And so that we thought was having a dynamic tool uh, would really serve our, our client base for both traders as well as uh, risk administrators. Great. Um, so, so when we acquired them, um, you know, although it was a small company, I think the key is with, whether it's a huge acquisition or small acquisition, and when I say big or large in terms of personnel, it's really important that um, obviously you're welcoming. It's really important to make sure that um, the individuals feel like they're quickly integrated. I yeah. think because we had already gone through our transformational journey, all these things, whether it's you know the mission or the principles or the culture or the fun aspect of things or the global aspect of things, <coughs> those were already in place. So all we had to do was, you know, we had these various I would call them brand books and say, hey, here's a brand book. Let's sit down and talk about it. Um, and, uh, and I think the, the other aspect where maybe we were lucky is the individuals that came on board really, um, really gravitated to that. Um, it was a good fit from a culture. Immediately, they, they were, I think, seeking out that, um, that <laughs> part of an organization that had things, you know, already uh, moving in and moving in the right direction, but also really um, dynamic in terms of, of the workplace, uh, the client base, as well as uh, the employee base. Uh, you know, things were buzzing. Yeah. I, I love that you guys acquired a company that you already knew was going to be a good fit for your culture. Because I think that a lot of times people when they're looking at targets, they don't even think about that. <clears throat> and then it can become a big cluster. You know, I, 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 I don't want to oversell it. Um, I think we, we did our due diligence. We met people that we thought would be a good fit. But when the day is done, once the, once the ink is signed, you still don't really know what you get until you have it. Um, so I think we were a bit lucky too. Um, and I think that goes into it with any acquisition. You do need a little luck from a culture standpoint. Um, and, and, and yeah, you are taking some risks. But again, it goes back to, well, sometimes you have to take risks. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. they, well, luck with, along with your intentionality sure. yes. <clears throat> of what you had already been doing with your existing people, bringing that to the new folks. So really great words of advice for anyone who is looking at acquiring or merging with another company to like 
in your due diligence, at least get a sense of what the other culture is like and how people think and how they perform and what they do when times are tough, right? You know, <clears throat> when, when things are good and people are performing, that's one thing, but how, you know, what's the, the, um, what's the fabric of, of the culture when things get tough yeah. is a really important thing to try and understand in the due diligence process. And, and as, as the acquiring company, um, if you're in that position, uh, you have to take culture into account. If there are individuals that are not the right fit culturally, even if they may be um, excel on the technical aspects, you have to weigh those and determine if that's what you want. Um, you know, we, there were some technical folks um, that uh, were more consultants versus, hey, we want to bring them on fully into the company because, um, you know, goals were different, right? Yeah. So, so those are also has, have to play in a factor of, of your due diligence as well as making some tough decisions uh, when, when acquiring uh, not just the company, but, you know, when you think about resourcing. Yeah. I mean, and, and as we're talking about this, what came up for me was WeWork, right? Their IPO fell apart recently because of some cultural missteps and which created some mistrust among their largest venture capital investors. And they were like, you know, we can't really go to market with this right now. Yeah. So and it's that important. I mean, people have been chomping at the bit to get a piece of WeWork and now they're saying that the valuation of it is, you know, what, a third of, of what they thought it would be? I mean, a mess. And as a marketer, I go back to that is your brand, your promise, your reputation, all those things flowed into the value of your brand. Yep. And if you um, betray that, then, you know, and what we're seeing is you're going to pay for it and pay for it in a bad way. Um, so you need to be true to your brand promise um, because if, 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 you are, if, you, if you align with your brand promise and, and play with integrity, um, you're going to be successful. Yeah. Well, that's a good segue to the next piece of this acquisition around surveillance. Um, and as you said, it allows people to, to monitor the trades, I'm assuming internally and maybe even externally. Um, Compliance, obviously, huge, huge, hugely important in the financial markets. You know, should ever since Enron and and in various ebbs and flows, really since then. Um, and you know, the conversations that I'm hearing a lot of my clients have around compliance is compliance isn't enough. Like just to have the rules that you know people have to that. <clears throat> The compliance has to be married with a culture where people are committed to doing the right thing, not just an order that this is the right thing. And so the difference between have to and want to, the difference between rules and values that include integrity. So I'm just curious how you see that evolving for you guys and your customers. Sure. So our approach is we want to make sure our clients and their clients or the end user, the traders, um, are successful. Now, what does success mean? In the world of um, trade surveillance and compliance, it's to provide the traders and risk administrators with the tools that they need so that they know how they're trading, what they're doing, and making sure that their strategies are in line with what is acceptable behavior. And for the way that we have it is it, there's a scoring system. And so you know the range of, of where your, your activity falls in line with the different rulings as well as the different, um, the, the different uh, regulations out there that um, oversee uh, the future trades. And so by giving these tools, um, we feel like we're actually empowering the trader. We're empowering the risk administrator to, to, to as you say, develop that culture of um, doing not just the right things, but being most successful within um, the roads, uh, the, the rules of the road, if you will. 
Right. Um, and I think if if traders, you know, embrace these tools, they could actually, um, you know, optimize their activity and not have to worry about someone looking over their shoulder, but focus on what they're they're supposed to be doing is is trading, right? Um, from the risk administrator standpoint, it's giving them the tools to make sure that you know they are there protecting their firm, and so that's sort of our mentality with regard to to um, to this product set. Yeah, it only takes one rogue trader to bring down a firm's reputation for a long time, if not permanently. Yeah, and and yes, and and those. I mean, we don't want to sell the fear. We actually want to sell, you know, and 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 let, um, you know, potential clients know this is uh, to make sure that you are, uh, you know, you have, you have the power in your hands, yeah. right? That that you are proactive in this versus, um, you know, selling the fear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Well, that, that go again goes to selling the fear is compliance selling the vision of success is culture yeah. and yeah. you know the vision so yeah. it, and, and here we are right back at vision to you know <laughs> be the operating system for the capital markets and in order to get there it, it, the operating system is going to have to be in compliance yeah, with that, all the regulatory issues that has to be an element of it <clears throat> yep super well this has been so interesting and I hope that those of you who are listening and watching haven't been distracted by, you know, some of the, the finance, you know, jargon and, and, and tech speak and so forth. Cause I think the messages that have really come through loud and clear from this conversation that you and I have been having, Brian, are the importance of your three C's, right? What the, the, the craft, the communication and the culture and, you know, the intersection of all three. Is, is where magic happens. And in terms of the importance of communication, thinking about if you're leading a company or even a division of a company or, or a, a product, whatever it is, take your show on the road to communicate with your employees in other areas besides headquarters. Take your show on the road to meet with clients for no good reason other than just to connect and make sure people are current on, on what's happening at, at your business and 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 there and no mysteries are created um, and the the whole thing around acquisitions right there's I mean with with all with a million startups out there acquisitions are are happening quickly and we have to pay attention to culture both in the acquisition target and then in the intentionality with which we onboard the new company and integrate. Culture is a key piece of the integration fabric. Um, and then lastly, whether it's because there's a trading platform monitoring compliance or, or not, getting our folks to a place where they're not feeling like forced to abide by a bunch of rules because some regulator in Washington said this is what we have to do. You no, know, getting them to be part of a vision and a culture that values integrity and doing the right things and has ethics because that's how businesses thrive, right? I mean, the difference to me is, is palpable and obviously you can see I'm so passionate about it. So thank you for sharing your experience with all of these issues with our audience. Uh, thank you. I, I, I had a great time and hopefully it was helpful to your audience and uh, Absolutely. great to you. I appreciate it. Sure. Any last words of wisdom before we sign off? You know, the one last thing we talked about is, you know, I came from a consumer environment into more of a B2B environment. When it comes down to it, it's B2 people. You, yes. are, you are marketing, communicating, connecting with people, and it doesn't matter what industry you're in. I think that's the important thing for your business to thrive. B to P. You should you should go register that right now. <laughs> yeah, right. As your trademark. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know your last name is pronounced Meta, and doing B to P B to P as a concept is very Meta. <laughs> I like it. Maybe we could collaborate on something here. I love it. Well, thanks for joining us today. 
Leader Shifters, thank you for joining us and we will see you next time. Until then, if you have any questions for Brian, you can um, reach him through me. Email me at hello at theleadershiftproject.com or on any of our various social media platforms. Until next time. Mwah.